Hello, good evening from Fort Myers, Florida, and good evening, afternoon, good morning uh, to you, wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you so much for joining us for this program, Hurricanes and Mollusks. My name is uh, Sam Ankerson. I'm the director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum, and we thank you so much for being with us uh, during this time for, for an update on the museum and for Jose's program. A special thanks to everybody who's joining us, who has been impacted by this storm. And I know there are many of you who have had damage to your homes, livelihoods, lives, and everybody's dealing with a lot. So thank you for making time for this. Uh, thank you for the moral support for the museum and uh, thank many of you for the financial support as well um, over this last month. Uh, it's been a, uh, of course, a, 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 an experience unlike any other, and it's a, uh, it's a, a very powerful thing, this, this collective trauma for all of us um, in this community uh, who, who are impacted by this, uh, but also the collective rallying and encouragement is is even more powerful and um and i know it's going to be part of all of us coming back and uh, so thank you for 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 being here for this program um before we before we move to uh dr leal's program which is a uh, presentation which is really interesting we we ran through it yesterday um i wanted to share some updates uh, in the six weeks since the storm uh, kind of what we're what we're what we've seen at the museum and where we are right now and i'll uh, i've got some some photos which um which we'll, we'll walk through in a moment and uh, for those of you on our social media channels or who receive our emails um, a couple of them are, are ones you've seen but uh but there will be more as well to to give some some broader context to um to the current situation. Questions um, we'll, we'll hold for after Jose's presentation. Uh, we're in a webinar format here, so uh, the way to ask questions, you can ask them at any time, they'll, they'll be tallied, uh, but use the chat function um, along uh, either the, the, the footer of your screen or, or sometimes at the top, just mouse over the, the chat function and type in your question. And those will be those will be stored and held, and we look forward to uh, questions and answers uh, following Jose's presentation. This program, as with all of our online uh, programs, is is being recorded and will be posted on the museum's website as soon as we can get to it. Usually within a couple of days, but certainly within a week. So if it's something you either want to watch again or or share with someone who is uh, who might be interested and is unable to to be here for this uh, it will be on the museum's website under education and then lectures so with that um we'll go into some um some slides we'll we'll take a look at um what's been going on with the museum so uh, we'll start with with some exteriors and I guess you know we'll we'll begin with with the 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 physical impacts to the facility um which uh which are which are major we we have we have water and structural damage on all three levels but wanted to start with some exteriors to also point out that um you know for those who who aren't on the island or or who haven't seen our um our posts. Uh, the building is standing, and um, and apart from what we'll what we'll describe in some more detail, the uh, it's structurally sound, and um, it's there. <laughs> this picture is taken from San Cap Road, just a couple days after the storm. The first time we were able to get on the island, and uh, you can see some of the the telephone wires uh, down there on the road. Here are a couple of views, one from the um, one from the, the traffic circle in front of the building. And for those of you who know the building well, um, if you can see my, my cursor here, that is typically where the, the letters that say Bailey National Shell Museum are on the building. Uh, they were not blown off in the storm, um, although that would be 
a first conclusion. We actually were uh, planning to repaint the museum and just two days after the storm, ironically enough, we power washed it and, and took the letters off um, in order to paint. But, um, but as you can see, apart from um, some damage up there on, on the edge of the roof, um, the front of the building is, is sound. And then here, this other picture the, from the, the staff parking lot, the south facing side, that's how that is looking. The, the main events that, that have caused the most damage to the museum are, are five and a half feet of flooding on the ground level. And, um, and then this hole in the roof, which you see on the, uh, on the left. So this is about a, a 20 foot long by about three or four foot wide uh, hole um, in the roof. And, uh, and that's, that's daylight coming through. And it's, um, so that's coming into the third floor of the museum, which for those who don't know is where the offices are. It's also where the collection is stored. Um, hundreds of shells are on exhibit in the Great Hall of Shells, but there are hundreds of thousands in storage in uh, up on the third floor in these in these metal collection cabinets. Uh, this posed a, uh, uh, of course, a, a, a risk uh, threat to the collection with the elements coming in, and uh, unfortunately, um, with with that hole. Um, both the rain from the storm and then a couple of hard rainstorms that occurred after the, after the hurricane and before the roof could be temporarily patched, which was on October 14th, um, that allowed more water to come in, uh, bringing water damage to the third floor and then subsequently down onto uh, the second floor as well. On the right, you can see um, how the, the hit that the roof took uh, looks from looks from the ground. This is in the Great Hall of Shells, uh, and I'll start by saying the beloved uh, Luke Century windows are all fine, but during the storm, uh, through whatever um, through whatever impacts there were, this hole in the Great Hall ceiling opened up. It's also about twenty feet long. There is not a, a hole in the roof above that, um, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, however, um, again, for those who, who, who know the, the building well, the, the cupola that is uh, above, the, uh, above the Great Hall, the, the soffit uh, was essentially torn off, the soffit facing the, the, the west gulf um, side was torn off which during the storm and its, and its rains uh, allowed water to come in and, and cause moisture and mold damage to the, to the ceiling, um, to, these, to these upper walls we see right here surrounding the, the Luke Century windows and uh, water and, and mold damage to both. Moving down to the ground level, and I apologize for this silly photo of me, but this, this was also taken uh, a couple of days after, after, after the storm when we were able to get in. Uh, the ground level, for those who don't know, uh, houses our admissions and lobby, our gift shop, and also the living gallery of aquariums, uh, which opened in um, 2021. And I'm pointing there to the water line. So that's that's a, a five foot four inch water line that is uh, indicative of of the flooding that was on the ground level and is consistent through throughout the ground level. This is in the lobby in the admissions area uh, before any cleanup started. Um, of course, you can well, it's self evident. Moving into the living gallery of aquariums on the left uh, is the gallery that, that houses the, the touch pools, the cold water and warm water touch pools. Uh, you can see the, the kind of force of the flood sort of bringing furniture and, and all kinds of uh, debris in there. Uh, on the right is an example of how nearly all the aquariums uh, looked when we got there. So um, uh, flood water, 
ran through just about all the aquariums. There was a period of time before the generator was knocked out where the aquarium pumps were still operating uh, and, and yet there was water on the ground level. So flood water was being pumped through the aquariums. And when we arrived, this is, this is how most of them looked, either sort of half full or, or less so uh, with and, and, and filled with, with flood water. The, the marine life, uh, we, we lost about 75% um, of the animals in, in the living gallery. Um, the animals that survived included amazingly, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit more, the, the flamboyant cuttlefish. And then apart from the cuttlefish, uh, nearly all of the local mollusks survived as they've been through conditions like this before. Just some more images from the ground level. This is the store, the gift shop. Again, on the, and, you know, on the right, you can see more evidence of the, the force of the water moving through there with a collapsed wall uh, pretty quickly. On the left, you can see how the mold is starting to, to take over. And outside, uh, although there's not much damage to, to most of the external functions of the museum, our, our air chillers seem to be fine. But these, these two um, objects here are 900 gallon tanks, which we use to make our, our own salt water at the museum uh, to make and, and um, balance and then distribute uh, our own salt water into the aquariums. 900 gallons, both were full of water. And uh, this is just a, um, a kind of a compelling picture to me of uh, how they were just tossed aside and their, and their pipes snapped off with, with the flood that, that came through. So those are the damaged photos. And, and following, as, as everyone who's been contending with this knows, following a, a, a processing of an assessment of the damage comes the, the, the next part, which is, which is cleaning and mitigation. And you'll, you'll hear me say mitigation a few times, and um, I've used the word mitigation more frequently in the last month than uh, I ever thought I would, and I'm sure that's, that's true for many of you. Uh, but uh, the staff was able to get in to the museum on a regular basis um, on October 9th was, was, we got in once before that, but on October 9th, we were able to get there regularly and uh, before, the, before the causeway opened up, thanks to boat access um, from, from nonprofit partners. And, and staff began cleaning in the way um, everyone has been with, with mops and just trying to get the muck out of there. And then beginning um, on October 19th, um, a professional, uh, professional crew of mitigators came in and completed the cleaning and also began the work, particularly on the ground floor, but elsewhere as well, of pulling out all surfaces that not only are water damaged, more importantly, have mold damage. Um, mold spreading very quickly. You don't want it to spread, fur spread further. And so it uh, becomes necessary to take out all drywall and other surfaces on which uh, mold can spread. So you can see here on the left is the lobby and on the right is a shot taken um, from the living gallery into what we call the research lab. The, the extent of, of, of what needs to be taken out or and was taken out. These are some recent pictures from, from other, other views in the aquariums. And um, again, you can see how, how walls and ceilings have been, have been removed. Um, some good news is that the, the aquarium structures themselves seem sound. We, we have been, um, been testing them. We're actually going to bring in some, some uh, friends and, and peers from, from other aquariums in Florida to help us evaluate this but the, the tanks themselves seem okay. And you can see here that um, our staff has, has made a lot of progress in, in cleaning them. And um, this is how they appeared uh, about, about three days ago. 
Moving upstairs on the left is a photo of the Great Hall ceiling. So this is, um, I mentioned before, how, how water came in and mold was spreading on the trusses. And uh, the Great Hall ceiling has been, has been gutted and to prevent um, further problems. And soon, the last couple of days, they're still continuing, continuing with it, the, the walls surrounding the loop, set, loop century windows, but not the windows themselves, will are, are undergoing the same treatment. And that should be, should be completed by the end of the weekend. On the right is the collection storage area or part of the collection storage storage area. So that when we saw the picture before of the of the large hole in the in the roof, that's that area. And um, walls, ceiling, carpet, everything has uh, has been pulled out. So that process, as I said, will 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 should conclude soon. And um, I wanted to mention um, some other activities that have been going on in addition to, to managing the, uh, the cleanup and the, the mitigation and addressing the most, um, the most at hand kind of crisis problems. Um, staff has been uh, focused on other areas as well. So the, the first thing that we sought to do right after the storm, not knowing the condition of the building or anything going on inside, uh, was to attempt an animal rescue, uh, to see, um, um, to attempt an animal rescue. And right here, this is on October 2nd, which is four days after the storm. That's our uh, Aquarius Carly Hulse and a couple of us heading out um, by boat, courtesy of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Ding Darling, who got us out there and then got us to the museum. And I can't stress enough how um, proactive, helpful, generous uh, so many <clears throat> have been, particularly in the time before the bridge opened back up to make it possible for museum staff to access the islands, not only get there, but then get us from, um, from whatever dock we were coming into to the museum and back again. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Ding Darling, the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, Crow, and um, perhaps um, most of all, the city of Sanibel, its staff, city council leadership, um, doing everything they could to help us and others uh, access and, and um, try to get accomplished what, what, what we could um, to to address, to learn about, and then address the problems at the museum. The animal rescue was was not not without its successes. Um, you know, the um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, about about seventy five percent of the marine life was lost um, due to the floodwaters and the loss of the generator. Um, however, the flamboyant cuttlefish, of which there were six, for whatever reason, that aquarium was clear. We don't know why, but it was. And the six cuttlefish were fine swimming around as they usually do. There were even uh, egg casings there. And we were able to um, we were able to rescue them and with help from our friends at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa, um, bring them to shore and then get them to a safe place where they are now. Uh, the local mollusks which survived, we we released to to Tarpon Bay, and that's the picture um, on the right. Uh, another another thing we looked to do was to was to try to salvage as much of the back of house aquarium equipment as possible. I mentioned the the tanks themselves seem fine. Uh, there's a whole lot of equipment back of house filters and pumps, um, pipes. All kinds of things to make the systems run. We were in touch with uh, the designers of the aquariums who helped us create a priority list for what staff could try to salvage before the, the demolition, demolition work needed to begin. So here are some photos of some, but, but not all, of the equipment that we were able to, to pull out uh, with the idea being is that when we do reinstall everything, um, this won't be equipment that we need to replace. Uh, we're in process now of 
of testing all of this uh, to see to see what works. But this was um, a small a small win amidst everything to be able to uh, to be able to do this kind of salvage. And then, of course, the shell collection, which uh, um, you know came under real threat with uh, the conditions up on the third floor. So to to remove the the most at risk segments of the collection um, from from the elements essentially, and then also to um, make space in order for the mitigation crews to go up and pull out the walls, carpet, and ceiling that they needed to. Staff over a period of two weeks, uh, teams of staff every day for two weeks, um, again with the help of our help of our friends, were able to get out to the island and and relocate um, about forty percent of the collection. So that's a that's over two hundred thousand specimens, um, one drawer at a time, and you can see. Um, staff member um, on the left with one of the drawers, or about about fourteen hundred of these drawers, and uh, and ultimately about ninety of the collection cabinets, which we brought down to the second floor, um, to an unimpacted area of the museum, which is which is where they are now. And the remaining remaining collection up on the third floor, which is away from the uh, where the whole was which is now temp which is now patched um is 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 sealed and protected and now with with power having been restored to the museum recently um has proper proper climate control so a temporary safe keeping of the collection was uh was achieved and something we um again small win but an important step and that's that's where we are um our our main priorities right now are, are 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 rather simple it's it's four four main priorities one is one is to to stop the bleeding and and there's the facility wise and that's there's that word mitigation again and that is nearly complete we've we've been in a period as many of you have with your homes or businesses where a uh, a period of where you know things just seem to be getting worse before they can get better and we we feel we have a handle now on what we're dealing with and um we'll soon be able to turn to the next part which is what reconstruction and rebuilding looks like and i just want to emphasize that that is what we plan to do um this museum is um is important to to the field it's important to the community it's important to sanibel and it's it's a success um, a lot of a lot of people over over 40 years have made it so and included a picture here of uh, some of the, the founding generation of the museum in the lower right that's uh, founding director Tucker Abbott, um, his friend Raymond Burr who helped bring it to be and um, and others this is um, um, there's a real history to the place and um, while we've suffered a lot of damage we we know we can we know we can bring it back um and um and we're going to um so practically speaking that means that means we're we're talking to um contractors and beginning to get an idea now of the steps to take costs and timeline uh the collection stability um remains a um a major priority for us and and a goal coming out of this is something that um, um, you know for those of you uh, on this on this Zoom who have who have been close to the museum for a while, it's it's something that's been discussed in the past, and the storm has really brought it into sharper focus. Is is we believe there's a need to um, find a a permanent home for the shell collection off island. Not I don't refer, I don't mean the exhibits. Um, those um, those belong on Sanibel, we believe. But the collection itself is um, is something we're looking into um, moving to the mainland for um, a higher a higher level of um, of safety, and then and then lastly, but but certainly not least, is continue continue doing what we do, um, continue our mission driven programs, continue educating. Um, there are programs we can continue in the near term. One of them is the 
mollusks on the move um, education outreach program is a photo of that um, in the upper left this is when educators go out to schools community center community centers youth centers in uh, throughout southwest florida with portable touch tanks and shells and and educate on mollusks this is something we can continue um, online talks and lectures <laughs> doing one right now, but uh, that's something we can continue and are looking forward to. Um, we have ideas for other, let's call them in the field programs, citizen science ventures, online exhibits. Uh, it's important to us to, amidst this period of rebuilding, uh, to continue um, doing what we do, um, if not best, what we do well, <laughs> which is um, educating in this in this field that that we all love so much. So it will be a long road, um, but we're we're energized for it. Um, we're we're energized by the fact that that you're interested, um, that you're here. Um, it's it, you know it remains to be seen what timelines look like, what costs look like, uh, as far as addressing all of that. Our our uh, our calculus will be, you know, as for many, this will be a, a mix of, um, of insurances and, and FEMA and Small Business Administration and, and philanthropy. And uh, again, as mentioned before, um, we extend a, a great thanks to everyone who has stepped forward in these last six weeks to provide support well wishes, moral support, also financial support, which is is critical right now, as it is for so many organizations. And um, and I'm happy to say that you know hundreds of people have have donated, and and it's it's and of course you know we welcome further donations. Donating through our website at shellmuseum.org. Donate is one way to do it. Our addresses still work; they're being forwarded to. A, a temporary mailbox in um, in Fort Myers, and um, and so thank you, thank you very much. This is a great community, and uh, and the Shell Museum is going to continue to be part of it, and we're proud to be part of um, of your community. So, and our thoughts are with everyone who is experiencing this in in whatever whatever way. Um, so with that, that's that's the end of, uh, of, of my update. And um, with questions, please please put them in the chat. We'll we'll keep track of them. And and I'd now like to introduce my friend and colleague and um, someone who's been uh, central to to the life of, of the museum for um, since. Well, almost, almost, almost the whole existence of the museum. Um, so, for hurricanes and mollusks, uh, Dr. Jose Leal. Thank you, Jose. So, I hope all can see my um, first screen. <clears throat> I wanted to first of all thank Sam for um, coming up with the idea for. Um, for me to give this talk and, and also thank him for, um, you know, being a true leader in, throughout this uh, predicament that we're going through. I mean, um, you, you never want to have a category four hurricane landing on your, uh, on, on your backyard, but if you do, you wish you had someone like Sam to manage the recovery. I mean, he's been fantastic. So thanks so much, Sam. It's, uh, you know, it's a it's a lesson that we are all getting there. So, um, and Sam was the one actually, as, as I said, who came with the idea of this talk. We, you know, going to the island, one of our first trips back to the museum post Ian, and looking at that brown water. Sam said, "Well, why, you know, why don't we do something about mollusks and hurricanes?" And uh, and I, you know, put this little presentation together for you. Um, and uh, I just want to make make sure you all understand at this point that, uh, as I mentioned here in this slide, this this is not based on actual research we're doing, and uh, after um, after the hurricane, 
but um, mostly based on what I, what I call educated guesses and predictions based on you know, what we know about hurricanes, the way they act and, um, and the way mollusks live. I mean, the biology based on a you know, combination of the hurricane effects um, on the biology, the, the, the ways of life of mollusks. Um, just want to uh, mention a couple of things here before we talk about our little guys, that uh, there are many, many large, fast moving, wide ranging animals that can get the heck out of Dodge when a hurricane is about to land. Sharks are a good example. So there, is, there, there are papers published on you know, the reaction of several species of sharks uh, that can somehow feel the changes, the um, atmospheric and oceanographic changes that happen prior to the landfall of a hurricane. Um, this is a paper published by uh, scientists at my uh, old alma mater, the Rosenstiel School, uh, University of Miami, uh, in which they have shown that uh, tagged sharks um, evacuated uh, Biscayne Bay, which is the shallow area um, around the city of Miami neighborhood. Um, prior to um, hurricanes Matthew and Irma back in 2016 and 2017. Um, they came back later and um, they, could, they could get that information because the sharks were tagged with uh, you know, uh, little um, radio emitters that allow the scientists to track them, you know, know exactly what, where, where they are within a given range. This is also true for other fish, like, like this uh, great trigger fish here that was um, shown to evacuate um, an area, a shallow water area um, of North Carolina a couple of days before the arrival of hurricanes Jose and Maria back in 2017. So yes, they can do that. Some sea turtles can do that. Dolphins um, are also known to um, evacuate but um, our guys can do it. And here I have a little, little cartoon that, um, you know, assuming that, um, th that this little, little gastropod knew that something was about to happen. There was nothing he or she can do about it. Um, and this is assuming that they can perceive the arrival of a hurricane. We don't even know that they can, most likely not. So yes, mollusks, don't move fast enough or cannot move at all, which is the case of oysters, mussels, and so on. So let's see how um, some of the effects of hurricane that, that will bear on mollusks. And this is, um, of all this brief presentation, this is probably my most important slide because it encapsulates the main effects of um, a hurricane that could affect um, you know, mollusk populations and <clears throat> sea life in general. Storm surge. Uh, storm surge comes with waves, and it, and it's not just uh, you know a gentle rise in its, in in the level of of, of the sea. Uh, it's strong. There's a lot of dynamics, a lot of movement. Currents are are formed. Uh, you know, currents can affect as deep as 300 feet in depth um, of coastal areas. Uh, the coastal areas are toxed, tossed, and mixed with colder, saltier water that come from, from below. It's kind of a brief moment of upwelling where cold water comes um, from the deep would carry more salt with it. And that will have a, an effect uh, on some populations that some mollusks that need lower salinity water, such as oysters. Um, we have intrusion of rainwater that will come from, the, from land to encroach on the coastal populations of shallow water organisms. Um, we have deposits of sand and mud, um, and I will be, I'll be illustrating and showing a little of that as we go forward. The water gets murkier, there are lots of sediments. Um, and last but not least, we have man-made products that, that will um, leach into the water, such as fuel, oil, um, battery acids, um, sewers break and bring uh, polluted sewer water to areas that normally don't see that uh, that intrusion, so all that will have will bear an effect on on mollusks. Um, on the coast of West Florida, we have another 
uh, situation that compounds the problem because the continental shelf, the area of the continent that's submerged <clears throat> is really, really, really shallow for a long, long area. Uh, that's almost, you have almost another Florida underwater down to the depth of uh, about three, 400 feet. Um, whereas on the east coast of Florida, we basically, there, there is almost no shelf um, in places like um, Palm Beach County and Stewart and so on. So that exposes a lot of living populations to that dynamic, to the steering of the waters caused by a hurricane. Um, Well, let's talk a little about those effects. And then at last, at, in the latter part, uh, we will show some uh, examples from mollusks themselves. So storm surge um, and its um, associated high waves and the strong currents uh, will have a very strong effect on coastal populations. This is a photo, a lot of you may have seen this photo. It's a place that uh, is very familiar to all the Sunnyvale residents. It's the uh, McGregor Boulevard just before the Tall Plaza, a place I drive through every day when I go to the museum, um, showing the, the power of the storm surge that lifted the blacktop off the, the avenue there. I mean, literally, you know, peeling the, the asphalt out of the road. Um, so imagine that, uh, that power, that effect on uh, the shallow water burying um, organisms and uh, even in, in attached animals such as oysters and mussels. Here another example, um, you know, the power of storm surge. I have a few photos that I actually, uh, photos of the damage. I hope you don't mind me, you know, kind of bringing back those memories, but we're trying to make a point here that there is a lot of water movement, a lot of um, commotion going on um, at the, uh, the area that sits between the tide lines um, during and after a hurricane. The, the, there is a change in the coastline. The, the bottoms will shift. Um, you know, sand moves from one area to another very, very quickly. Uh, this is an example here of a photo of the Sanibel Causeway just prior to um, you know, the very fast repair that was done to it. So you can see that a lot of the sand, a lot of the soil that was uh, um, along those uh, man-made islands was moved and was moved elsewhere. And when it gets moved elsewhere, that means that sand is burying um, living organisms. We also have the problem of the steering of sediments that will cause a lot of, um, number one, water turbidity. The water becomes really murky. And um, there's a lot of stuff suspended in seawater and that will harm or have an effect on uh, the feeding or filter feeding mollusks such as oysters and other biovolves. This is just another kind of dire example of uh, how sand gets moved. Um, you know, this is all sand that was moved from uh, the area of Fort Myers Beach onto the uh, Estero Boulevard and uh, you know, the, the, the streets and avenues of Fort, the city of Fort Myers Beach. Um, uh, another photo of Sanibel Island to um, uh, allow me to make the point of, um, you know, that coastal waters will, will be uh, mixed with rainwater. Um, and uh, in here, you can see little, little dark water brooks. And those uh, little bodies of water are nothing but uh, the storm surge water returning from land back into the Gulf. And when that happens, we'll carry with it a lot of pollutants. Uh, it's basically washing everything from, from land back into the water. Um, so you have all that, uh, that uh, most likely noxious substances coming back to uh, harm uh, the coastal populations. And again, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, about man-made uh, substances, um, substances that will leak or leach from man-made uh, structures such as vehicles, boats, um, batteries. Um, we have sewers, their uh, sewer lines are broken. 
we have pollution, uh, the coming out, and all that in a very short amount of time. Um, oysters are probably one of the main uh, groups of mollusks that are affected. Um, number one, um, they are fixed, they can move much, they cannot bury, they are just sitting there like sitting, sitting ducks. And, um, and all that change in um, salinity, either for more saline water, more salt in the water coming from the bottom with the storm surge, or uh, rainwater will cause uh, strong changes in the ideal brackish water salinity that oysters demand. Um, on top of that, lots of sediments will uh, encroach on, um, on oysters, probably causing them uh, to basically clog. Uh, as you know, oysters are bivalves, and bivalves are filter feeders that intake water, filter the water for food using their gills, and expel the water through um, this other siphon here. Um, when there's too much um, sus suspended sediment, uh, they may not be able to get rid of that uh, excess um, silt or, or fine sand or mud as fast as need be. So they may, the populations may collapse. Um, so we have a situation also where we have populations of bivalves <clears throat> that live at different uh, depths in the substrate. Some like lucines who live deeper in the water, I mean, in the sand. This is the, uh, the sand water interface, the sediment water interface here. Um, some of them live deeper. Some of them like cockles live almost don't burrow. They live very, very, very shallow, shallow in, in, the, in the sand. Um, pen shells, are attached, they cannot go anywhere. They're basically sitting in the same spot for life. Um, what, what can happen in a hurricane, as, as I just mentioned, is uh, you may have the, that normal height of the um, sediment water interface being either um, rising, you know, so sand will, will uh, um, basically bury those for life. So basically the animals are, are, um, are buried alive. You may have that situation or you may have the opposite when uh, too much water movement will remove the sand, making those guys, uh, rendering them, um, uh, you know, sandless, meaning uh, they will be, there will be no support. They will, be, they will just collapse. They won't be able to retain their, their, their life uh, postures, and uh, and that's that will be a threat to to, uh, to those species. Uh, those are pictures of pen shells, um, or you know, uh, two two different local species, uh, the stiff pen shell and the uh, seminate pen shell, and you can see how they are uh, just so they are buried just at that little um, little depth, and with part of the shell exposed out, so they do can do their filter feeding. Uh, sand can bury that and they, and they, they are gone after that. Um, we also have um, <clears throat> mollusks that, um, mainly gastropods, that, that live very high above tide line. They almost never go in the water. Um, periwinkles are a good example. Uh, the placid periwinkle um, uh, lives on um, hard substrates like rocks and concrete. Uh, those are all local species, by the way. We do have the cloudy periwinkle uh, on a picture here on um, Cayo Costa. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, cloudy periwinkles live on dead wood high above the tide line. And the, the mangrove periwinkles uh, live on living red mangroves in this area. So they like the living trees. Uh, and then we have uh, coffee melampus and other species of melampus in this area, all of them living really high. And you can imagine uh, that uh, number one, uh, with storm surge, they will be submerged, which is not good. They don't like to be, you know, underwater. Um, if there is strong wind, they can they can just go with the wind. So that's another group that's probably very highly affected by uh, the power hurricanes. Um, we have the burrowing, uh, free living burrowing, sand dwelling. Um, um, 
animals like uh, Florida fighting conks, lightning whelks. Here, sun ray venus being eaten by a lightning whelk here in the area of Bunch Beach in Fort Myers. And horse conks that live uh, on, on sand and uh, rely on the sandy bottoms to find their food and all that. All those um, species are most likely affected by the power of hurricanes. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about hurricanes and shelling. Um, you know, people, uh, I, I read a lot about uh, uh, on social media about folks that were apparently, um, you know, very uh, enthusiastic prior to the landing of uh, Hurricane Ian. And I was just shaking my head. I said, well, you know, hurricanes are bad. They're bad for people. They will be bad for the populations of, um, you know, sea life. Uh, in the midterm. And uh, yeah, yes, there is good shelling after hurricanes, but most of what you see are, um, uh, is the result of, you know, the populations being wiped out by the strength of uh, a hurricane. This is a photo I took way, way back in 1998 after the um, passing of Hurricane George in the Gulf of Mexico. It, it didn't make landfall in Sanibel, but brought a lot of shells to, uh, to the island. So yes, hurricanes will bring shells. They'll keep bringing, uh, the shells will keep coming for a while. But remember, all those are animals that have perished uh, because of the hurricane. We, we may have other problems that may uh, cause you to think twice before you go shelling just after a hurricane. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, just some news about, um, um, you know, the. Uh, outbreaks of bacteria that happen when uh, you have the sewer lines breaking um, after the storm surge hits them. And that's something to keep your eyes open for. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be, uh, get in an, into an infection or get uh, eye problems uh, by, you know, touching the water and then touching your eyes. So you have to be careful about shelling after a hurricane. Um, if you want to keep a, a, an eye on the water quality, I strongly recommend you check the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation uh, water quality monitoring, monitoring um, resource, uh, their website that uh, is here is a track, water quality tracker. Um, and as you know, um, SCCF is our next door neighbor on Sanibel Island. Um, on a positive note, uh, you know, recovery always happens. It may take a few years for things to be um, back to normal. Uh, hopefully we won't see much of that in practical terms because the shells will keep coming, you know, coming back um, with winter storms. The, 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 the shells that were um, mollusks that died during the hurricane will have their shells pushed back onto the, onto the beaches during the winter storms. Um, and uh, in terms of the living populations, they will come back. They always bounce back. You know, this is not the first hurricane in our area. Those animals have been there for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions in some cases. Um, there might be little changes in the species composition. You may, you may have new, new species coming in and uh, from other areas, you may have some of the local species um, locally disappearing. We never know. Um, so it, it will be a cool thing to keep our eyes peeled for those changes, what's, what's happening after Hurricane Ian. Uh, on a posit I mean, another positive note, a sign of hope, um, our friend Lauren Buckner sent this picture of a horse cock he, he, uh, he found uh, living uh, off Bunch Beach um, but in late October. So yes, not all, not all of them are gone. You know, there are those uh, survivors that will be the foundation for, you know, the new populations that uh, will, uh, will multiply from now on. Um, I have a picture here that uh, it's been, it was uh, part of our, um, you know, marketing of this talk. It's a picture I took in Cayo Costa a few years back. And uh, to me, it has a very strong symbolic uh, meaning in relation to recovery because it shows cloud, cloudy periwinkles on a dead uh, black mangrove tree. It's a trunk of a dead black mangrove in Cayo Costa. And uh, if, the, if the dead black mangrove is there, it, if that dead black mangrove was killed during Hurricane Charlie, 
that did a lot of changes there in the, that coastline um, of uh, Upper Captiva and, and Cairo Costa. Um, the periwinkles return. That's my point. And, uh, and we will hope that, uh, you know, our, our friends will bounce back and, uh, and things will go back to a quasi, quasi normal um, state pretty soon. So I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for um, supporting the museum for being there um, when we need. And uh, I hope to see you soon and yeah, keep your questions coming. Thank you, Jose. And uh, thanks for including the bit on, on, on shelling after hurricanes. It's a little bit of gallows humor maybe, but, uh, but it, it reminds me. So, so in, the, in the two days before the storm, we were, we were going, you know, going full speed around the museum to, to prepare the museum as best we could for the coming storm. And, and it was on Tuesday, the day before, um, before the storm hit that, um, that the track changed and it was clear to everybody that it was, it was going to be coming right at us. And, um, a few of us were in the museum making last preparations and, and we were just about to leave and the phone rang which it hadn't uh, at all. And, and, and the phone rang and we answered and the person was asking, okay, so the hurricane's hitting tomorrow. Where's the best place for me to go shelling this weekend? <laughs> so it's like, I really don't know how to answer that. And, and we didn't, but, um, but thank you. Great, great presentation. There are several, several questions and, and, um, and comments and, I think uh, I'll start. There were a couple questions about whether specific species survive. So Maxine was asking if um, if the, the the lightning whelk that was um, um, survived, and the answer there is yes, and was released to to Tarpon Bay. And I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, Zo Z E A U Zo. I love that name. And asked if the uh, Genonia survived, and unfortunately not. That was um, among the uh, the very very heartbreaking losses. Uh, the octopuses, the Genonias. Um, no, the Genonias did not survive. Um, uh, Dr. Gregory Herbert at the at the University of South Florida, who is a researcher and who. Um, helped through his through his research and his research vessel um, in the Gulf helped us uh, collect the those genonias is is going out on another venture at some point in the next couple of weeks Jose right um, and um, so we we hope um, to you know that we hope that that he's successful but no the, unfortunately the answer to that is is no um, Angie asked uh, for to um, for asked what percentage of the of the shell collection was moved down to the second floor uh and the uh the answer is, is 40 percent so uh, 40 percent of the collection cabinets themselves were were moved down to the second floor uh not into the great hall but into the the unimpacted area of the second floor so if the total collection is about 550,000 specimens, roughly. Uh, that's about 220,000 specimens. Alan Gettleman asked about the type collection. And uh, the, the type collection was actually, is fine, and was moved off island to a safe location as soon as possible. I think we were able to, to do that October 9th or 10th or something like that. I think Jose, maybe our, our, for our first visit there, we were able to do that. And Alan also asked if the library is is okay, and the answer and the answer is yes. And now that climate control has been restored to the third floor, there's a um, um, we're we're happy about that. That any 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 risks that 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 a lack of climate control could pose to to paper in particular um, is um, is no longer a problem in the library. There are a couple questions here, Jose, which I think um, ask you to answer. And let's see, one was from Angie and Dan Killam had a question. Hi, Dan, glad you're 
Glad you joined. Thank you. Dan asked, did you find any articulated bivalves transported whole with tissue to shore or elsewhere? Well, it's, it's I, I don't, I, I don't know that I understand the question. We, we moved the local species off, um, you know, the living bivalves were all um, returned to the um, babe, uh, you know, between Sunnibel and the mainland. Um, none of them perished um, as a result of the hurricane. And, and Sam mentioned that they're very resilient, you know, shallow water species are exposed that normally, you know, at high tide, at low tide, and, and, and they go through a lot of salinity changes. So those were fine. We, <clears throat> we returned them to the water. Um, I don't know if I answered uh, Dan's question, but uh, um, so yes, uh, I see also a question about the lightning whale. Um, uh, all the local species, all the local specimens were returned to the bay. Um, I also want to make, um, to add to what Sam said um, in relation to the collection is that there was no, at this point, we don't, we didn't, we don't have any damage to the specimens in the collection. Uh, we moved them to um, to the second floor. The, the cabinets that were affected, there was some. Uh, we found some some damage on the bottom of the cabinets. Some rust was settling in, and we we examined all the bottom drawers and uh, and we found a couple of maybe when I say a couple, maybe about between forty and fifty uh, collection boxes that were um, that were wet. And I replaced them on the spot with, you know, and, uh, but there was no damage to the collection. That was the part that was moved. The more, most affected part of the collection um, were the cabinets themselves, not, not what's in, what was inside the cabinets. Um, and, uh, and I also want to thank everyone that helped, um, you know, Sam and all the staff that helped uh, over two weeks move drawer by drawer without the elevator going down the steps uh, in the dark, uh, there was quite a feat. I mean, it's something out of uh, an epic movie almost. So uh, that was, you know, yeah. so the collection is safe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John asked, is Anne's hospital display okay? So that refers to the, the Mollusk Hospital exhibit uh, and Anne Joppy's exhibit. And yes, that uh, it is fine and, um, and still at the museum. So <laughs> um, let's see, there's a question from Angie here and it may relate to what you just said. Let me just find it here. Sorry, I'm scrolling. Um, what percentage of the collection had already undergone preservation exercise, separation of specimens from paper data labels, removal of cotton wadding from Opercs and insertion into separate plastic bags, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we, uh, it's an ongoing process. We don't have a, a count of, you know, we don't know the percentage. I would say that the most of the collection, um, as we could see now, most of it had, um, had um, you know, old labels separated into archival um, Ziploc type bags. Uh, you know, cotton had, has been removed from um, inside shells with, with, that had their opercula, um, but it's an ongoing process. And Angie, the person who asked the question is one of the, the, our volunteers, who, and I'm very grateful for all, all that you do and all the volunteers with the collection area. Um, Rachel asks, will the specimens and storage that will be moved inland be on display somewhere? Um, um, maybe not, not a, not, not a immediate answer to that. Um, we, you know, among the things we're thinking about, and I, and, and I don't mean to suggest there's a, a plan in place for it right now, but in this period of, in this period of rebuilding, uh, perhaps there's a way for there to be a, um, a temporary, um, exhibit of specimens in, in another location. Um, but, and then there's, you know, something we've talked about in the past too, is in, you know, pre-storm, pre, pre but uh, the idea of a, a kind of a, a, almost like an open storage approach to um, exhibiting specimens. Not all of them, of course, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of them, but it's, uh, 
is something that in in a perfect world we'd we'd love to do. So we we would love to, you know, it, um, you know, the Great Hall exhibits we think somewhere between you know between five hundred and six hundred specimens, and the the collection holds somewhere between five hundred thousand and six hundred thousand. So there's um, lots and lots of potential for um, for exhibiting um, a greater quantity and, and diversity of the collection. Um, okay, Eugene asks um, a question about climate change and uh, long-term durability, and it's a great question. Of course, this is a, a very extreme storm um, to which, uh, in which climate change plays a role? No question. Um, uh, that's part of that's part of our thinking in in wanting to um, have the shell collection on the mainland. Um, we continue to believe that the exhibits that uh, the exhibits, the educational content, um, the the symbolic link between Sanibel and the museum um, is uh, is you know, leads us to, to, to believe that the, that the museum belongs on Sanibel and coming out of this, we'll, we'll adapt and find, um, find better ways to, to, to protect ourselves. But, um, but good, good question. And of course, very timely. And I'm scrolling here. Lots of, lots of, lots of great comments. Maxine asked, how about the Great Hall exhibits? All okay. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, they're they're fine. All the work that's going on in the Great Hall, with the ceiling and the walls, the exhibits are protected. Some of the exhibits did did get some water exposure. Um, the 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 land snails exhibit, the the fossil exhibit, and um, a little bit the uh, the Calusa exhibit. But uh, I would say water exposure, but not water damage. So with the focus in the Great Hall is on the uh, is on the the areas behind the drywall and the ceiling up high to um to take care of that. Ali asked, did the sailors Valentine survive? Yes, they did. Thank you. And that I believe are all the questions. Thank you all very, very much for your questions and for your interest and and for for joining the program and for uh, for everybody who is uh, who is impacted uh, good luck I hope each day brings a, a little bit of improvement and um, and please continue to stay in touch with us and we'll continue to, to stay in touch with you thank you very much have a great rest of your day uh, thank you thank you